Hi, I am Mary Comerford. I am the director of the Furman Counseling Service here at Barnard. And I wanna talk a little bit about the psychological effects and ways to cope with the COVID pandemic. I wanna thank Jeffrey Ng from Fordham and Larry Long at the University of Kansas Medical Center who shared some wonderful PowerPoints. So sort of here's the situation. I think a lot of us may be feeling this way. There's a lot of uncertainty about the pandemic, how long it will last, what's gonna happen. There's a lot of foreboding, a lot of loss of safety. And although so many of us across the world are experiencing these things, we're not all experiencing the same things. There are many people who are considered essential workers who are going in. There are people who have families who are essential workers, who are taking a lot of risk and then coming back home. There are families who have sick family members, people who may be sick themselves. Then there are the many people who have lost jobs. They're worried about paying their rent. There's worry about food insecurity, housing insecurity. So people are differentially affected, many quite profoundly at the level of some of our most basic needs. So I'm gonna talk generally about ways to try to maintain balance and functioning in this difficult time. So I think one way we cope emotionally is being able to name the feelings that we're experiencing it. When we name a feeling, it sort of contains and binds it. So I think if we look at our general experience right now as grief, and grief actually has many different parts, many different emotional aspects. Um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, when she worked with people who were dying, began to articulate stages of grief. They were denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Now these stages don't follow one after the other. They're not linear. They're not necessarily, not everyone experiences all the stages. People can jump around. People may stay stuck in a certain stage. Um, but I think they're very helpful as a way of understanding what's happening with us. David Kessler, who worked with her near the end of her career, actually are, developed a sixth stage, Finding Meaning, which I'm going to talk about as well. So initially, the first stage is classically denial. So this virus won't affect us. It's over there. We're going to be able to block it from coming in, or it's not going to affect. I don't have any risk factors. I'm not worried about it. I don't have to worry. People were in shock. People were avoiding dealing with things. There was a sense of unreality. I, I don't know what's happening. I can't believe this is my reality now. Anxiety and fear is sort of anticipating loss and grief. The mind runs ahead and thinks the worst that could happen. Worrying about the health and safety for yourself or people you care about. Worrying about your classes and academics. What's going to happen with internships? What is the job market going to look like? How are job opportunities? What about money worries? And then, of course, people who are food insecure have lost jobs, have housing insecurity. These are enormous worries that are just preying and grinding on people. That can lead to anger. You're making me stay home. You're taking away control of my own life and my own choices. Our anger can be vented toward politicians, health authorities, Barnard administrators. Also, it can be vented towards certain communities. I know the Chinese, Asian, and Asian American communities have been targeted by people's angers and online trolls. Bargaining. This is sort of the attitude where people sort of might negotiate with God. Well, if I do this, then this will be okay. Or if I, if I social distance for a while, then everything will be okay, all right? I can, I can maneuver this. So it's kind of negotiating, and it's very common for people who are theists and sort of want to negotiate with God. Then depression is a really common stage that I think many people are experiencing now. I don't know how or when this is going to end. Kind of the initial worries and fears of everything have calmed and people are in a more flat, hopeless state. Um, there may be a lot of losses um, and also people may be ill and dying that they know or that are close to. Um, also feeling lonely, bored and helpless. All of this works to develop more depression. 
Finally, for Dr. Kubler-Ross, acceptance was sort of the goal, where we just come to terms with the bad thing happening. Okay, this is happening. I have to deal with it. So we decide I can wash hands, I can stay at a distance, I can work remotely, I can visit with people, I can stay connected. When we reach acceptance, we sort of find a little freedom in that and a way to move forward. And then finally, as I said, David Kessler brought a sixth stage, finding meaning. And I think this is one of the most important stages that we'd like to work toward. Finding meaning in loss helps us find a way forward. So it's not just, okay, this is happening, but rather asking, how can I grow from this? How can I become a better person? So it may be, how can I grow individually? How can, if you find yourself back with your family, how can our family improve our dynamics to be more connected? Maybe a broader community, how my community can respond and change. Even asking of the global community, how can we respond to care for one another better? How can we take care of the planet in other ways? So there's a, a questing for meaning that's broad or individual, and it's very um, personal, an own person's search. Some people turn to activism, volunteering. Some people try to nurture their relationships that they already have. Artists may become very creative in pouring their experiences into their art. Finding meaning really helps transform these incredibly difficult times into something that is productive of growth, healing, and transformation. So now I want to talk a bit about how to cope with all this. And I'm starting out with, I think, the most important thing, practicing self-compassion. Many people are used to having extremely high expectations about themselves and their functioning and they find it's just not happening now. And there can be a tendency to be judgmental, critical. It's not okay for me to feel bad. I'm not in the terrible crisis some other people are experiencing, invalidating our emotional realities, being judgmental, not being flexible. So we're encouraging everyone to really treat yourself as if you were supporting a very dear friend in being patient, being compassionate, realizing the amount of stress everyone is under is compromising functioning for all. And the more patient and kind we are with it, the more quickly we'll be able to move forward. This is very important also. Please limit and monitor your social media and news consumption. I know myself when I watch the news and I look at the hospitals in New York City, it can be very frightening and I find my anxiety just grows. So you might want to decide to read the news, maybe in a very reliable source once a day, or you know, be very careful about what you're exposing yourself to because it doesn't really help to crank up our anxious responses and having our biochemical stress response building in our bodies just by the news. So it's fine to watch news and stay informed, but be careful not to become flooded or overwhelmed. Very important also, please stay connected to people. We are biologically programmed to connect with others. When we're by ourselves, we stew in our own thoughts, our own biochemical realities. But when we're with other people, we tend to shift. Our world expands. Their psychological states impact our psychological states. It can be uplifting and nourishing. It can also be stressful, so, but definitely try to choose nourishing social contacts and, and maintain those. Schedule appointments with friends. So here's a kind of happy example. You, there are people singing together. There are online dance parties. Whatever you enjoy doing, try to connect. Here's another bunch of ideas for social connections. Set up dates with people. Uh, do a charades. To join a Netflix party, do karaoke, play social games, join a book club. There's a lot of virtual activities now going on and people are being incredibly creative. So whatever your kind of cup of tea is, join that and put it in your schedule. It will really be nourishing. Then speaking of scheduling, for many of us, our normal routine is just entirely disrupted. And many people are negotiating classes, 
uh, being with family, maybe being with children, trying to work on a job. There's so many different demands. So it's very important we try to create a structure and routine for ourselves. Structure holds us and helps contain anxiety and emotional overwhelm. And it also helps us feel more in control and normal. So please try to structure and set a routine for yourself, not to hold it rigidly, because remember, we're being very compassionate, but something to hold lightly to kind of help contain and motivate us. And then it's very essential to take care of our basic needs. Always sleep and food. That's the floor that we stand on. So if you're having trouble sleeping, and I know many people are, it's hard to fall asleep or it's hard to stay asleep, you might want to consider an over-the-counter medication for a few days just to begin to get some really good rest. And the same with food. If you've lost your appetite or you're feeling nauseated or you're having some stomach distress, try to find some foods that are gentle on your stomach but that you can get in. The more we're better nourished and have good sleep, the more we can combat stress and our mood will improve. And then exercise, moving around. I know many of us spend hours now in front of the computer. Maybe you can look at different rooms or walk around or take, you know, just get out. Many people are doing online video exercising, whatever you enjoy, stretching, just moving. Um, try to schedule that as well. Gratitude is extremely important. They've actually found in research that people who undergo very difficult times, if they are able to counter the pain and the despair of those challenging times with moments of appreciation and gratitude, people actually get through those times much better and have more resilience. So for example, let's say someone in your family is ill and you're very involved in caring for that person and you're worried for their safety and you're worried for other people's safety. So it's a very difficult time. But maybe friends are checking in. Maybe they're bringing food for you or picking up prescriptions for you or doing things to help. Try to have moments to appreciate things that you can be grateful for that you appreciate. That will help hold both perspectives and help counterbalance the fear and despair of the stress. Some people are keeping a gratitude journal. They're writing things down every day for which they're grateful. So try to develop a strategy of focusing on things you're grateful for. Sometimes people are outside and they hear a bird song and they just hold that moment in gratitude. So try to notice and highlight the positive moments that are coming forward for you. Then we also want to recognize we're vulnerable for everyone. There is so many stressors pressing upon us now. And when we're highly stressed, our normal defenses and coping strategies become more vulnerable and more fragile. So we all have like our kind of ancient traumas and fears and anxieties, and they're just kind of impinging upon us at deeper levels now, whether we're aware of them or not. And we may have emotional swings from feeling fine to feeling irritable to feeling depressed to feeling despairing. We could swing into many different states. Try to just accept that as okay. You want to welcome the full range of your feelings without judgment. So here's an example. Yes, we can feel grateful, but we can also allow feelings of being disappointed about things being canceled. We can enjoy time with loved ones and we can feel annoyed and irritated by their constant presence and close presence in our lives. We can feel hopeful about some good things happening and also have panicky feelings that everything's falling apart. So this is an example. You want to have feel a room and space for all of your needs, not just trying to be positive all the time. That's not going to work. There's a saying, what we resist will persist. So allow the full range of your feelings and they're more likely to flow through you and move on. Then finally, please get outside if you can, but do maintain the physical distancing. Breathe. If you can't get outside, just open a window. Going for a run is great if that's what you like to do. Even walking, noticing the things you're sensing. What do you hear? What do you see? What can you smell? Just being aware of your surroundings outside can be very healing. If you have a dog or an animal, take the dog for a walk. 
Of course, some dogs have been walking so much they're sick of it. Um, but nonetheless, being out with your animal or even without an animal can be very healing and restoring. Then taking care of yourself in any way that feels um, nourishing for you. So studies of motivation show that when we do things that we have to do all day long, our motivation and drive to do them decrease. But when we do things like playful things, fun things, sleep, all kinds of things restore us and give us energy that resupply that motivation and drive. So be sure you're doing some fun things, whether it's watching movies, maybe doing some cooking or baking, maybe writing in a journal, maybe you like to do yoga. Here's some other ideas. There are museum tours you can do. You can take a class. Um, you can learn a language. There's so many options right now. Um, there are many things to do. So find out something that will be nourishing and feeding for you and put that in your regular schedule. Then stop thinking about what if and worrying about things that you can't control. I know it's hard. We run into the future and worry about all those things. Try to think about what is under my control. What can I do now? What can I do today? And here's a, a kind of graph about that. The things I can control are turning off the news, taking care of my own social distancing if I go out. The things I can't control are, is there going to be toilet paper in the grocery store? Or what about other people who are not social distancing? So if we can try to not focus on those things and just focusing on the things where we have agency and control, it's going to help us feel better. And then to work on being mindful. Mindfulness meditation is a huge and popular thing now. Being mindful is bringing your awareness into this present moment of the now. And if you think about it, being in the moment now is really all we have. And if we can fully become in the now, because for most of us, right at this moment, things are bearable. They may not be overwhelmingly excruciating. If they are, I wouldn't focus on, I'd just cope with that. But for most people, the now moment is bearable. So bringing yourself to now, what am I feeling right now in my body? What am I thinking right now? Just watch the thoughts go across your mind. What are my emotions right now? Just say, oh, now I'm feeling irritable or oh, I'm feeling kind of grateful right now. Just observe and describe your emotions and let them go on. That's trying to be mindful, and they find that that's enormously helpful in coping and helping our body and our emotions and our mind stay present and focused and calmer. So here's a little Zen moment from Lao Tzu. For the, when we're depressed, we're tending to worry about the past. If we're anxious, we're running into the future, but there's peace in the present. I think it was Mark Twain who once said, I've been through many terrible things in my life, and some of them actually happened. And he was highlighting how when our, our mind takes us to terrible places, but if we can kind of stay with what we're really experiencing currently, um, there's relief in that. So here's a number of examples of some mindfulness resources and apps. Many of them do have a cost, but most of them also have some free options as well. So please take a look and see which ones you might like. The Karu Mindfulness is designed explicitly for college students. So take a look at some of these and see what might be helpful to you. And then finally, I want to really stress that Barnard is here for you. If you are trying these coping strategies and you're fine that you're still, in, still overwhelmed, you can call us at the Counseling Center. We are happy to meet with you. Um, the primary care remains open. You'd call to make appointments. So many other services, cards and Dean of Studies are available. Residential life is working very hard. Student life beyond Barnard. So many services now at Barnard are here for you. One sign of successful people is that they are able to ask for help when they need it. It's a sign of courage and strength to be able to reach out and say, this isn't working. I need some help. And it's really a ticket to success. So I just want to emphasize we are here for you to support you in this time. Thank you so much.